A wonderful good morning everybody and welcome back here to my channel and as promised I'm bringing you some new content today. Together we're gonna have a look at the modern metagame, how it is shaping up right now and what the top five decks are, how we can beat them. This is not a sideboard guide, this is more like options that you have to bring in in order to beat these kinds of decks. Um, I made sure that with any of the top five contenders, I brought in some uh, spicy options next to the ones that you typically also see me playing. Um, but I think both are important aspects that um, are a little bit, coming a little bit too short um, when we're talking about magic and gameplay in general. So, um, just having your options, having information about what's going on and not relying on, you know, yourself just cobbling together the, the important data that you need for your deck. So periodically, we are going to go ahead and take a look here together on what we are facing and how we can solve the problem. This is, of course, specific to Grixis Control. Um, this is not meant to be... Um, a sideboard guide or a guide to beat certain decks with any deck. This is always from the perspective of Grixis control and potentially, of course, all the control decks that are also playing the colors. So let's jump on in here and have a look at the modern metagame. Um, it is like the decks are so many. I went down to below 1% to compile this data and therefore ran out of uh, colors to use. Um, so you will have um, some shades and shapes uh, repeating here, but overall I think one can determine each individual deck. So looking down here on Amulet Titan at 10%, the clear front runner in the modern format, but of course Amulet Titan really is only the deck that plays both the Titan Amulet of Vigor and all the bounce lands but if you can uh, look at the top left and there is also some at the one percent or lower bracket so overall we do have four similar but different types of titan decks that i'm compiling together to 15 percent of the meta so the clear front runner here being Amulet Titan, then we have Mono Red Prowess, then there's a couple of mid-range decks, Eldrazi Tron of course going over the top a bit, Bajan and Ban Snowblade now with access to Uru and Kroxa respectively do also go pretty big or can go pretty big. Then there's Dimmer Wirza, a deck that still does have access to an infinite combo with Thop the Sword, and then there only after that we do have the typical front runners of modern with dredge tron blue white control and then there is a couple of death shadow variants uh, which i also put together to at least six percent here of the metagame and yeah that's how the modern metagame looks right now we already knew that titan would be one of the strongest contenders in the post-ban meta of January. Now, we have to look at how we can beat them. So, the decks to beat and how to beat them on rank one here is Amulet Titan with 10%, Field Titan with 3% and Titan Shift. Of course, um, this doesn't mention all the cards that we have to beat in those decks, but these are the most problematic cards. Primeval Titan, Field of the Dead, Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, and Dryad. All of the above mentioned decks run this core. Uh, to a varying degree, some decks are running two Field of the Dead, some are running one or two or three or four Valakuts, but basically all of the decks are um, fighting with these weapons. And of course, that's difficult from a couple of perspectives. Formerly, we only had to get rid of a Primeval Titan in order to stop the Amulet Titan deck. Now we also have to beat Field of the Dead, Valakut, and Dryad. And for the rest of the decks, 
that is the same. So how do we actually go about it? So these are our options, the best options here. Of course, Ashiok is one of the front runners to just stop our opponent from searching their library entirely. But our opponents, of course, know that like Ashiok is one of the most utilized cards right now in the metagame to fight Amulet Titan, and therefore most Primeval Titan decks will have an answer to Ashiok in the likes of Engineered Explosives, or maybe a Pact of Negation, um, Mystical Dispute, these kinds of things to uh, stop it com from coming down or just beat it while it's on the battlefield. Mm, nonetheless, one of the best options for us. Then there's Damping Sphere. Damping Sphere, of course, doesn't shut off Field of the Dead and Valakut, and also doesn't shut off Dryad, uh, which makes it significantly worse than it used to be against uh, Primeval Titan, but it is still an option to slow them down, and then you can still fight the mid-range uh, version, basically, of the deck, where you just have to one for one and hope that they don't get out a Field of the Dead. Um, then I was already talking about Ethergust in one of my last videos, and I also talked about it with um, Pedro, who is typically a Grixis Death Shadow player, and they adapted Ethergust in order to just get ahead a little bit on tempo, put it back on top, get that extra turn to maybe get like 10 damage in or a team of battle rage or whatever, just finish the game that turn so that you don't fall behind. Ethergust is great because it gets around um, the... Um, what's the name of the land card that I'm thinking? Yeah, Ethergust of course gets around um, Cavern of Souls, which we usually have a big problem with. Then there's the first spicy card in here. Um, Dryad, of course, makes it so that all lands are each basic land type, which means all their lands are all the time also islands as soon as Dryad is out. Dryad is one of their um, first targets to get. Even before Primeval Titan, most of them want to have a Dryad out uh, in order to just ramp them a little bit and then get the... Uh, mana types in order to like because they play a lot of these clunky um clunky lands that produce colors mana or red mana that they typically can so dry it will be out most of the time and if you let it leave uh, alive and just at that point can use boil to destroy all, uh, all islands this of course also destroys your own islands therefore it might not be the best option if you're playing three to, uh, basic islands plus one or two mystic sanctuaries. Um, then, of course, you're going to destroy a whole lot of your own. But you can plan for it and you will definitely get your opponent um, on the wrong foot. And that might already win you in the game. Because at that point, like they're trying to spam out their lands as fast as possible. So they probably don't have any lands left in the hand, and you might just take the couple of turns that you get from that um, to get ahead and win from there. Then there's Fulminator Mage, a card that is in here because it is an option, but I think it's one of the weakest options right now. Um, you have so many targets that you have to get rid of. You do have to play uh, around Veil of Summer. All the time and they are packing so much redundancy that Fulminator Mage remains to be an option if you have it in your sideboard there you typically find cards to take out and to bring in Fulminator Mage but as I said not my first pick here uh, then we have Shadow of Doubt similar to Ashiok of course but more surprising a card that just renders a couple of spells unusable in that turn. For instance, Pact of Negation to Laria West, Primeval Titan, of course, itself. So um, it's probably a supplementary card that you want to use in combination with something else like Ashiok or Boil or Fulminator Mage or whatever. Um, but definitely an option and also depending on 
like how aggressive you, aggressive you build your deck. Probably even a better option for you than Ethergust. And last but not least, we have Blood Moon or uh, Magus of the Moon, of course, that just turn all of their non-basic lands into mountains. Um, I think they are playing like four forests right now, two snow covered, two non-snow covered. Um, and with Dryad out, that is a layered effect. So it happens in zone six, which means it's only time stamped and will therefore depend on whether or not you played your moon first or he played the dryad first and yeah so that is an option but as with boil um that will of course also limit your own options let's head on to the deck to beat number two and again we do have a couple more here with mono red prowess at nine percent and burn at two percent which i lumped together because they share a lot of the strategic and card choices with Lightning Bolt, Monastery Swift Spear, and then Bellum Reveler and Lavador are, of course, only in Mono Red Prowess. Um, but yeah, that is also just the biggest contender right now. So, what are our options? Uh, we're fighting with the typical Burn Hate uh, Collective Brutality, which is still alright. I would bring it in if I had it in my sideboard, but it is not really really great against Mono Red Prowess, especially because of the Lavadoids from the graveyard later in the game will always protect the creatures, therefore the uh, minus two minus two mode will mostly be dead and you're just getting two life and maybe discarding a card. So bring it in if you have it, but don't plan for Mono Red Prowess with Collective Brutality as your only option. Then there's Kalitas, a card that once it hits the battlefield, your opponent will have tremendous problems getting rid of it and dealing with it. Uh, once you have it on the battlefield for one or more turns, you mostly are going to win. So that is a very good option and would not take it out of my sideboard for a variety of reasons. Then Leyland of the Void, a card that you will see listed a couple of times here. And a card that I think, like I'm not a fan of Leylands in general because they are luck based and very lopsided once you have them. Um, but I think it should be an option again, not only because of Mon Red Prowess, but also because of a couple of other decks in the map being big in the meta right now. And yeah, of course it shuts off the half of Lava Dart, um, Bedlam Reveler basically completely um, and therefore, you probably want to have it in your 60 cards if you have it in your sideboard. Again, a card that you don't necessarily need to have in your sideboard or put into your sideboard if you only want to beat more red prowess. But if you have it, since you're going for the long game most of the time and can't really race the more red prowess deck, um, you do want to go after their resources in the graveyard, especially because they have so many canopy lands right now that they keep their own land count relatively low. And so it's even harder to cast the Bellum Reveler at some point. Uh, Fatal Push, a card that you either have in the main board anyway, or do have it in the sideboard like I do most of the times. Mm, you do want to bring it in basically because half of the deck's power just comes from Swift Spear and Soul Scum Mage and also Kiln Fiend or Steamkin. So you definitely want to have a clean answer in the first couple of turns against those creatures. Uh, Fatal Push offers a good um, option there. Then there's another spicy card here, Darkness. A typical Fog effect in black uh, that was reprinted in St Time Spiral. And that doesn't see a whole lot of play in modern, but I just wanted to mention it here. It's not one of the first choices that I would put in, but it is worth mentioning because most of your opponent's turns, you know, when they are trying to overload their two, three creatures with um, burn or metamorphosis, you know, they're just this flurry of spells in order to pump their creatures, and that is where most of the damage comes from. So with darkness, you get rid of those 
and can just basically gain 6, 9, 10 life with or for one mana, which is huge. So definitely an option. Uh, keep an eye on that if you have problems with mono red prowess and maybe proxy it up, try it out. Um, then another card here, or the last option on our spreadsheet, is Gifted Etherborn. Does have Death Touch and Lifelink, so all around good already. Um, but more importantly, your opponents on Mono Red, it's not as good against Burn because they have more options, but Mono Red especially does basically only play Lightning Bolt to target your creatures for three. Other than that, Lava Spike doesn't do anything against it. A Burst Lightning doesn't do anything until turn five. Lava Door doesn't kill it. So you probably have a good option here with three toughness to just stay alive and at least trade with a creature on the battlefield and gain you two life, which is already pretty good for two mana. All right, on position three comes in all the shadow variants. We do have four color shadow, Grixis shadow and Mardu shadow in the meta right now, although Mardu shadow is um, by far the least played deck. So the cards that we mostly want to get around are Death Shadow itself, Stubborn Denial, Thoughtseize, Tormogoyf and Goma Gangler. Although Tormogoyf and Goma Gangler in Four Color Shadow and Grips Shadow respectively basically take the same role and have the same weaknesses. And other than that, like Stubborn Denial is your most problematic opponent here in the in the matchup because you can typically deal with threats pretty well and also raise your opponent. So these are your options among others, of course, but this is compiled of cards that you probably have in your sideboard already or like Liliana's Defeat could put into your sideboard if you have problems with these kinds of matchups. So Fatal Push, of course, just great against Death Shadow and also super great against Hormogoyf. Against Grixis Shadow, of course, with the Gormag Anglers, that is a different beast um, for which you need terminates or drown a loss. Mostly drown a loss is also really bad against Gormag Angler because it shrinks it when coming down. Um, so fail push won't take care of it all. And that's also one of the reasons why I would not overload on fail pushes in the main or in the sideboard. But two to three of, um, fail pushes are always a good number to have. Liliana's Defeat is pretty good because it does kill any creature in the Grixis Dash Shadow deck that is problematic for you. Of course, no Snapcaster Mage, but all the others. And it doesn't get around Tarmogoyf, but sometimes they bring in Plague Engineer, they bring in Liliana's, you know, these grindy cards. And Liliana's Defeat will get around all of that. And if you kill a Liliana Planeswalker, it will also deal three damage to your opponent. So it will also help you raise the Death Shadow decks and just get a bolt for free, basically. Plague Engineer, if you have it in your sideboard, bring it in. If you don't have it in your sideboard, don't put it into there just to, uh, to beat the Death Shadow decks. But it is a roadblock on the battlefield. It gets around their counter magic, mostly. And typically the Death Shadow decks are taken out a little bit of the removal spells because they have to be more proactive and therefore can't deal with Plague Engineers and or Grim Lava Mancers so well. So um, that's a good option to have as well. Grim Lava Mancer, of course, seems to be underpowered. I wouldn't bring it in on the draw. On the play though, if you want to race your opponent, uh, Grim Lava Mancer is actually a very nice option because it shrinks your opponent's drawn a lot of which they sometimes play one or two copies so that even on the stack, you can um, just yeah nullify basically the the drawn and lock. Um, you can raise your opponent. You make your bolts better by just having a reach of five to kill a Goma Angler or a Death Shadow or a Tarmogoyf or whatever. It shrinks a Tarmogoyf. Um, it's just an overall. It, it it provides value against Snapcaster Mages. So it's just an overall good card in the matchup. Of course, on the draw, it's a little bit slow, but yeah. 
Um, Flusterstorm, because Cryptic Command mostly doesn't get you anywhere. They will have the Stubborn Denial in the crucial turns, and your Cryptics are just too expensive, and you just won't get any uh, use out of them. So take them out, bring in a Flusterstorm, get at least one, maybe two uh, spells on the stack, and just get rid of them. Your opponents are running low land counts, and therefore Flusterstorm is just a really good option along the curve like it's good in on turn one it's good at on turn five it's almost always good and therefore yep these are typically the cards that you want to have access to on number four here we're talking about and here i lumped a couple of decks together that i think are Similar in the way that you attack them or you can attack them. So Junt at 6%, Snowblade at 5%, and their Blue White Snowblade and or Simic Snowblade, Band Snowblade, whatever. And then there's Wirza with the same Astrolabe com color combinations. So cards that are problematic are Renetix, a card that I will also get to later as well card that I just don't like from a design perspective. It would be fine at 2 loyalty because a bow will get around it, but you just can't get it off the battlefield instantaneously. It Once it hits it, and it just always provides value of like 2, 3, 4 cards at the least. And it also just is really problematic for all your 1 toughness creatures. So this is one that you definitely want to render irrelevant to a degree that you can. Stoneforge Mystic, a card that you typically don't really have a whole lot of problems with because you are running three or four color guns commands anyway, but still one of the main threats that you will have to deal with. All of your removal gets the Stoneforge Mystic off the battlefield and color guns command gets the equipment, so that's fine as well. Then many of the John lists and or Maru lists um, are running Croxa as an additional value card. I've already stated my opinion about that card in Jaunt. I don't think it fits the playstyle overall because um, because for the most part your late game is already better than most mid-range decks. And Croxa, like you're not playing to the battlefield, right? The great thing about Tarmogoyf and why it's never been taken out of Jaunt is that it just provides so much pressure that your small round of disruption just can't get there. Croxa, on the other hand, is a 4-drop, essentially, and before that, just doesn't do a whole lot. And in Junt, where you have your Bloodbraid Elves, etc., and you're also very graveyard-dependent already, I just don't think um, that's a card that you're really looking for, um, and it's better in decks like ours, like Drixis Control, where you actually have a whole lot of answers and Crocs is just there to finish the game. Then there's Uro, quite the same, but here um, the Snowblade decks actually profit a whole lot in a variety of matchups from that Uro, because um, it does give you a little bit of life, so it's good against aggressive decks, it's very good in the late game, just draws you cards. Overall, just a card that most of the time you can't beat in the late game if you do not uh, go after the graveyard. Charmogolf, weak to graveyard hate anyway. And then there's Urza, a card that by itself you can get rid of, but is oftentimes being played in combination with Thop to Sword combo. So also a combo that goes through your graveyard. And therefore, most of the options here are also uh, graveyard hate that you want to bring in. Leyland of the Void again a card that most decks can't really handle well, therefore I put it in here. Ashiok, overall against all of these decks, a good option because it's one-sided as well of course, but also the search effect for Stoneforge Mystic, for um, the Wirza, like Wear of Invention cards uh, and fetches of course anyway. So Ashiok, very good. Jixx's Jader, a card that you'd never want to bring in against Jaunt, of course, but against Stoneblade, 
Snowblade, whatever, against the Urza decks, Jigsaw Jagger is actually your best cyborg card because it basically doesn't shut off anything that you're doing. You want to take out the Crocs against these decks anyway. Um, and therefore, the Jigsaw Jader is just a 2-1 beater that will get in for a little bit of damage and just shuts, just shuts off your opponent's graveyard entirely. So Uros are not coming back, um, the Swords are not coming back, and overall, yeah, just a good option. Kalitas uh, is good because of the end of the battlefield triggers when they're not being escaped from the graveyard of Crocs and Uro. So you just exile them, get rid of them all together. Um, against Urza, it's a card that actually goes toe to toe with Urza and can provide value over a long um, amount of turns. And then here's the other spicy card, Cling to Dust. A card that hasn't seen any modern play, as far as I know, but a card that you could put into your main board um, if you really wanted to have answers to Croxa, Uru, or whatever from the bin, and a repeatable effect as well. So against Junt, especially, I think Cling to Dust, and against Snowblade as well, Cling to Dust is actually a good option because they won't be hitting your graveyard in the first game, and you will probably get like one, two, or three activations out of that Cling to Dust. But mind you, if you're playing Croxa and Cling to Dust in the same shell in the main board, you definitely want to go with Thought Scourers over um, opts. And then the last one here on rank 5 or the 5th position is Eldrazi Tron at 5%. So typically um, you do have your beaters in Reality Smash and Thought Not Seer. Then there's Karn, always a threat um, because it can go after your lands with li liquid metal coating. It can provide a Warm Call Engine or another Walking Ballista, and then the Walking Ballista just gets rid of your threats really well, the small amount that you're playing. Here, Crux, of course, is very good if your opponent does not pack any graveyard um, hate, because it gets bigger than anything your opponent is really doing, except for maybe a Karn or a Nugan. Um, but yeah, Crux are here really good, does make the matchup slightly better. But overall, you still want to go with Kalitas um, because the Walking Ballistas, most of the time, if you're still in the game, the Walking Ballista just won't survive. Either you have a removal spell or something else, so that you profit from it with a Kalitas. You um, can really go toe to toe. Of course, Kalitas is smaller than Thorn Nazi and Reality Smasher, but it provides value against Matter Reshaper. Just overall a very good card in the matchup and it outgrows any of their threats. If you have it on the battlefield and kill one or two creatures, there's no coming back, basically. Especially backed up by some kind of magic. Here, Fulminator Mage is actually a lot better than Ashiok. So make sure, if you Eldrazi Tron and Tron are your concerns, make sure that you have a spread of Ashioks and Fulminator Mages in your sideboard. Um, cause Although they do not depend on Tron, Tron really helps the deck um, overpower you. And therefore, bring in your Fulminator Mages, go after their lands if you can, especially also Cavern of Souls, a card that um, does render Ceremonious Rejection, of course, uh, useless as well as a couple of your other counter spells. But Ceremonious Rejection, nonetheless, is one of the best cards that you could potentially have against a colorless deck. Uh, you can counter anything, but mind you that the first Chalice of the Void will always be on X equaling 1. And therefore, do not overcommit to 1 drops, both with <laughs> Ceremonious Rejection and Infernal Reckoning, a card that I just see here somehow got mirrored, and therefore we can't release... <laughs> um, Read the text, I do not know how that happened, but yeah, so it exiles targets colorless creature and we gain life equals to its power. So just a card that if your opponent's packing one, two or more K 
caverns, then Infernal Reckoning is mostly better than Ceremony's Rejection, especially also because it's better as a top deck than Ceremony's Rejection. It deals with stuff that's already on the battlefield. It does get rid of Womb Call Engine cleanly. Uh, it does answer Meta Reshaper. So also a very good option here. And then another Spice one here in Big Game Hunter, a card that I love dearly. I think it's probably a little bit overcosted at 3 mana. If it would be 2 or something, it would probably be playable um, also on a wider scale. But if you're hating on Eldrazi and big creatures in general with the Titan Titans running around, all the Titans basically, um, with Big Game Hunter, I mean, you can even discard it against like John or something. Big Game Hunter is just phenomenal. Um, so yes, uh, Big Game Hunter um, also sometimes relevant against creatures that do have regenerate, like, I don't know, against elves sometimes or whatever. But for the most part, you can just discard it with a Jacerin's Prodigy, get value out of it um, through mate Madness, and otherwise just have a one-for-one -one creature that potentially pressures a Liliana or whatever while also getting rid of a Tormogoyf. So yeah, this is that for the top five decks in the meta and which cards you want to consider to beat them. Of course, this is probably not going to be a um, and now the last part here of my talk is about the cards that I think should be a part of modern again or for the first time. So the cards that I see in modern right now are Splintrin and Preordain. Let me go about Preordain first. Um, Scry 2, then draw a card. Basically, Omen of the Seas for 1 mana. At sorcery speed though. I don't think that cantrips in general are in a great place right now. Because you are facing turn 1, turn 2, turn 3 titans. Um, there's a lot of combo decks running around. And a lot of disruption as well. Preordain, just a strict upgrade to... Um, Serum Visions, but by such a thin margin that I don't think it would be doing any harm to Modern whatsoever. It might make Storm a little bit more consistent, but that problem that deck has other problems than consistency, and therefore, like I don't see any deck that would benefit over proportionally from Preordain being a thing. Maybe the new Thassa's Oracle Ad Nauseam deck. But even there, like you can't just beat the deck, even if they do have their combo. So, yeah, Preordain, just a card that should not be on the ban list anymore. Then the other card here is Splinter Twin. Splinter Twin, of course, uh, a card that has been banned, I think, three or four years ago, um, which was always considered the police of the format. And. As someone else already said, I think Nikachu also made a video about it, um, so check that one out if you want to go diving into Splinter Twin um, on a deeper level. But overall, I think it would be good to have it in the format to enable Blood Moon decks um, and just have a police again against the, especially Titan decks, to be honest, because there's also the cards that I see not only dominating, but also being most egregious to play against right now. So the cards that I do not see in modern are mostly Astrolabe, Veil of Summer, and Once Upon a Time. So banning all three is probably a little bit too much. Pick two of them, and that would be fine, I think. Agum's Astrolabe just... What really pisses me off about it is that it provides, like we've seen in one of my recent videos as well, it provides... Three color decks the ability to splash red just for Blood Moon without having any red cards in their entire deck except for Blood Moon and no red 
mana sources, just because they're relying on that as outcomes astrolabe so heavily, um, and they don't have any drawbacks from it, right? You have one, two, three outcomes astrolabes, you're still casting your cryptic commands, your whatever Urus for double blue, double green, um, because you're playing around it so easily, and your opponents that are not playing outcomes astrolabe are just at a big drawback. And here the biggest thing for me is that wizards, as they sometimes do, or many a time, failed to include snow hate in Modern Horizons and any other set that is modern legal. So we don't have any way to punish snow lands anyway. Snow basics are just superior basic lands at this point, and I don't think that should be the case. Why do you have two different types of basic lands with you know just different names that are doing the same thing? that enable these kinds of stuff without any drawback. Um, I think that's a mechanical problem that wizards should definitely um, get on and try to solve by either adding hate or removing Occam's Astrolabe because there just has to be a downside for playing so much snow stuff. Um, Veil of Summer card that I have managed in basically any time I play against it and I will continue to do so. I just hate the card, not because it provides green with something to do on the stack. It is the efficiency level of it. It is that it does cantrip for one mana as well. It is always a two for one. It is, you know, many people compare it to a cryptic command for one mana. And in the situations that you are using it, it is always the case. And my biggest concern here is that Basically all the combo decks in modern are playing green for Veil of Summer. Even Ad Nauseam that doesn't have access to any green sources in their entire deck are playing four Veil of Summers in their sideboard just to have access to the card and cycle through their mana with Manamorphose or Pantel Prism to have access to green. So again, there's just no drawback for a one mana card that is protecting your combo um, and is not being used outside of combos, right? Neo Brown plays it, um, well, maybe a little bit um, of the Snowblade decks. Yeah, yeah, all right, they're playing that as well. But overall, it's just a card that is way better at what it does than Blue does it. And Blue should have the ability. Also not at this rate, like I'm not saying make Veil of Bl Summer blue, because that would be egregious as well. And there's another aspect here that I want to mention. Um, when I'm talking about cards that I think are too powerful, but for modern, I always take a holistic view. Like I do not look at it through my Grixis eyes or whatever. Like if there were days, if there was Brainstorm or whatever, I would also mention it and say it's too powerful for modern, um, but I just want to have a balanced format, right? I just don't want certain decks um, being so strong against other deck types that typically they shouldn't beat or not should should not beat so easily, um, and therefore get around the rock paper scissors. Um, checkmate mechanic behind magic that we should be able to rely on. And the last card of course is Once Upon a Time, also a card that has been banned in many formats and I don't want to lose too many words about. Everybody knows that card is just a mistake. I mean I like that Watsi tried to go that route both from a design perspective but also from the fairy tale, like it's the first spell that you play you're going into a fairy tale once upon a time, blah, blah, blah. And that's all nice, um, but it just adds too much consistency to green decks again. Um, decks that are very consistent already, um, for the most part, because they also already had um, access to ancient steerings. And yeah, it, it does exactly find these the two cores that most green decks need either one of their utility lands um, or creatures like Primeval Titan. And it just makes it so consistent and also is good in the late game, especially for ramp strategies. So yeah, these are my takes. 
on the cards that should be a modern and the cards that should not be a modern. And then there's a personal hate card. And here, I know that's contro controversial. It has been banned in Legacy. It has not been banned in Modern. I think it's too strong at 3 loyalty. Um, I think the upside is too big of playing it in any green red deck. Um, because you basically can't outvalue it. It also punishes like aggressive strategies like humans. Like with Ren and Six in the format, humans has really suffered because Noble Hierarchs are dead, you know, all your one toughness creatures are dead, and now you know you have to rely or go up on two toughness, and then of course Ren and Six isn't as good anymore. But you're also not playing some of the most powerful creatures that you have access to, and that diminishes entire strategies. And it's just two mana. Like if this would be three mana, it would be fine. If this would have two loyalty and would die to a bolt, then it would be fine. Not because it would not still punish the aggressive decks, but because the upside in other matchups wouldn't be as high so that you would have a real opportunity cost to play a random six on your deck. And yeah, I mean, the ultimate is just insane. Like you, you just can't beat the ultimate if your opponent does have any spell in their graveyard. Um, yeah, and if I compare it to a card that we're playing at two mana, our two mana Planeswalker, Jace Runes Prodigy, which dies to any removal spell, and then only half has um, half of the ability, this is basically Liana, the Last Hope, plus a Jace Runes Prodigy at two mana. And yeah, that's just insane, like power level wise. And therefore, uh, I just don't think that Renan 6 is healthy as a card, but I would not suggest to ban it from modern because I know um, that many people would have a problem with that and think it's a fun and interactive and good card that, you know, pushes John and yay. But again, it's a green card and somewhat at Waltzy seems to be a big fanboy of green and is just pushing wherever he can. And that is why we see such lopsided um, metagames right now. Also, I want to mention that many of the Eldrazi Tron decks are also running once upon a time now and from being entirely colorless also switched to being colorless green, like Green Tron. Um, we do have a lot of the other mid-range decks right now that are running green just to play either Ren and Six or Veil of Summer or Once Upon a Time or Uro. You know, all cards that are, uh, have come out in the last year. Um, and yeah, basically, I, I don't think any part of the color pie has profited as much as green has in the last year. Um, in Basically, since the inception of modern, right? I mean, there was Mirrodin where, you know, colorless was huge and that kind of stuff. But other than that, uh, yeah, the amount of things that green is able to do right now is just too much and therefore should be shrunk down in modern as well, as I already did in Pioneer and Standard and Legacy. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you uh, like this kind of video. So I'll go ahead and make more of those. Um, I know it's new. Um, I don't know how the reception about it is, but I think there were a couple of interesting and important points here that I wanted to come across. And I also like to take a step back and look at both the metagame, modern in general, and specific cards uh, from a holistic point of view. And yeah. That's it for today. Have a good week, guys, and enjoy modern.